In the area of trade, and I mean specifically export trade, the lumber business was at its peak. Um, it off, the Toby book often talks about 1853 being the peak of the lumber industry in terms of volume. This is a little snippet from the Toby book. Uh, it's a, a report from a collector of customs at the port of Brighton in 1853. Uh, there you see it, uh, exports from Brighton. Look at there. Lumber, 5,950,000 feet of lumber in one year at valued at 1,918 pounds. 6,457 railroad ties, 66 cords of cedar posts, 90,000 shingles, 249 barrels of fish, 8,547 bushels of wheat, and two horses. Business was going on. People were making money. People that were raising the products, people that were selling them, the merchants, and this was all going across the lake to New York State, to Rochester and Oswego. Why was that? Well, several reasons. First of all, it was supply. <coughs> They've been cutting down trees as people settled around here for years before that, but there was still a lot here. Wheat was a good price. And <coughs> was a high demand for wheat in the States at the time. And farmers knew that if they could clear more of their land, they could put it into wheat. That old wheat would just jump out of the ground in the good old loam clay up here in the township. And you could make a lot of money that way. But you had to clear the land first. You had to get rid of that lumber, that, those trees. So it was kind of a double whammy. You made money selling the trees to get the lumber, and then you could make money um, growing wheat. Also, as I said, there was a building boom going on in New York State at the time. Uh, so they would take every stick of lumber you could get on a schooner going across the lake at the time. All of this was made a little easier by the fact that uh, the British had reduced the tariffs. They were doing their reforms, getting more into a modern uh, economic system, a global trading system, so the tariffs between the, here in the States were down. So the lumber merchants here uh, could sell to the lumber merchants over in Oswego and they could all make good money. So it all kind of worked together for a time period. So lots of business being done. Very positive attitudes. The, the things in the Toby book for these years just kind of exudes this positive attitude, optimism. Here's another thing from the Brighton Sentinel, April 22, 1853. It says, Sirs, seven vessels have loaded in this port since the ninth instant, six for Rochester and one for Oswego. I am confident more lumber will be shipped this season than in any previous year. There's ample accommodation for all who may wish to deliver their lumber here. Cash can be obtained on, de uh, on delivering at remunerating prices for any quantity. In other words, open for business. Positive attitudes. Now, in order to get all this lumber out onto those schooners, you needed wharfs. This uh, is a snippet of the uh, County Atlas map from 1878 that shows that there were four wharfs operating on Presque Isle Bay during those years. I'm just going to outline the four here, and then we're going to talk about a couple in more detail. Way over here on the right-hand side is Proctor's Wharf. Uh, this was originally built in 1841 by John Nix, and was later uh, purchased by um, John Proctor. Um, so that was the first one that was there. You can see it's not, it's not real huge. It's way out in the end, the east end of Price Street, Gosport, out where the Yacht Club is. Um, it didn't go out a long ways in the water. It had that north-south cross piece on it. Interesting structure. Anyway, that was the first one. The second one is what we call Quick's Wharf. It was way over here off of Center Street, built in 1853. Um, originally uh, by the Brighton Wharf Company and taken over by William Quick. There were two other wharfs right at the bottom end of Baldwin Street, just a few hundred yards from each other. Now these were smaller and uh, kind of stayed around less long. They were probably, they were built later in the kind of boom time, so they, uh, as it says in the Toby book in a couple of places, they turned out to be ill-advised ventures. So I assume some of the investors lost their, lost some money on these. So there were four for the boom times to take all this traffic. 
So Nix is wharf, Nix Proctor Wharf. As we said, this was uh, this wharf was built in 1841. So it was built in the early 40s, and really was the one that was there to take the accumulating, growing traffic that happened during the 40s, leading up to this real boom time and uh, volumes of the 50s. What else was built around that time? It was the lighthouse. Interesting. Right in the same area on the bay, we had two major infrastructures built within a year or two of each other. The lighthouse was a civil engineering project by the government because they knew they needed to protect the schooners and the ship captains and the crews that were going in and out of this bay. They knew this was a tremendous bay for trade and, and they were going to support that. And the very next year, John Nix, businessman in the area, builds his wharf. So this set the stage for all this traffic and trade that we had going on for the next several decades was these two important pieces of infrastructure. Again, as I said, John Nix Sr. built the wharf in 1841. He died in 1851. His son, John Nix Jr., took it over, but he sold it uh, to John Edward Proctor in 1851. Now, John Edward Proctor is the Proctor we know to have taken the Proctor family fortunes to its peak later in the 1800s. Uh, if you've gone to um, Proctor House and gone up, uh, heard the story about how old Mr. Proctor used to go up to the copula at the top of the house and with his spyglass and look out and watch for uh, the ships going in and out of his wharf, it was this wharf there at the end of Price Street, Street and Gosport. This wharf was said to be the busiest wharf. We see this little tidbit from the uh, Toby book. It says, during the month of June 1853, of the 23 vessels arriving at the harbor, 18 docked at Nix's wharf. And this would be understandable because it had been there longer. Uh, the ship captains and the merchants, uh, the uh, lumber merchants would have all had relationships there. Um, later on, uh, it shows here again, 1860, Proctor's Wharf, previously Nix's Wharf, possessed storehouses and a dwelling house. From 1860 to 1865, Mr. Gustav Castle and Myridge Field commissioned merchants for our village, leased the dock for 200 pounds. The business was largely in lumber, grain, and merchandise. And I, there's a picture there of what um, one of the schooners going in and out might have been. They weren't large, but there was a lot of them. Crick's Wharf. Crick's Wharf was a very different situation. As I said, it was built over here at the bottom of Center Street. Ooh, but Center Street doesn't go through to the bay. Uh, but then it did. Now it doesn't. Center Street went all the way down to the bay. This map is from 1878, so it was that way then. I'm not sure, actually, when the road was closed. I'd be interested to come across that information. So Center Street went all the way down to the bay. And this was a very deliberate piece of business planning. Remember we said that the Presqu'il Road and Wharf Company was formed in 1853 to build the road, and they started with Harbor Street. At the very same time, another company was formed called the Brighton Wharf Company. And it was specifically designed to build a wharf. And the plan was that they would build Harbor Street down to the bay, and put this nice new modern facility of a wharf right at the southern terminus of the Brighton and Seymour Gravel Road. Deliberate planning. Um, a few, just very shortly after it was constructed by this company, uh, William Quick took it over. He was a very active businessman in the area at the time, so that's why we know of it as Quick's Wharf. This was huge. It says in the Dolby book that this was 60 rods long. Um, picture that. <laughs> it went out in the bay a long ways. And look, it had a building built out at the end of it. This building, it says, was uh, 85 by 130 feet, feet. So a big building out on the end of the wharf. They also built a, a warehouse, storage house, on the shore. And it was... 24 feet by 44 feet and three stories high. So we're talking major industrial installations. Serious business. We see 
uh, bits in the Toby book and other places about this picture of teamster wagons loaded with lumber lined up on the road waiting to unload at the wharfs, you know, to load the lumber under the schooners. Um, I, it doesn't say where that was, so it could be either uh, Nixon's Wharf down Price Street, or it could have been to Quick's Wharf down Center Street. Take your pick, probably both at various times. One of them specifically says that on a day in June in 1853, they saw 22 Teamster wagons loaded with lumber sitting in the road waiting to unload. So this was serious business going on. Uh, little advertisement. Oh, oh, I have to say, this wharf was probably there the longest. I don't know where it was when it was torn down or stopped use. That would be interesting to find out. But I have it on good authority from Ralph <laughs> that if you go out in the bay, and it's sort of off where there's a little um, Harbor Street Parkette where you can go off there's a little 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 uh, dock there. Out in that area somewhere, where Center Street came down to the bay. If you go out with a boat and look down in the right place, the water's clear, you can see the stones from that wharf, the foundation of that wharf, which would also be pretty cool to see. Anyway, a little advertisement here in the paper at the time. William Quick, forwarding agent and commission merchant of lumber and produce at Brighton, Preskill Harbor, in his storehouse at the wharf. Storehouse is quite new and capable of holding about 20, 000, or 12,000 bushels of grain. So, again, this is a serious installation, industrial installation, designed to support a lot of trade. And the two other uh, wars we don't have a lot of information about and where they're mentioned in the Toby book, it's, it's, it's often in a, uh, a negative way in terms of probably some folks lost some money on that just because they came into operation later as kind of the boom time was dissipating. So they would have not done as much business. But there were four at one point. 